Hello, and thanks for joining us. I'm Callie Breeze, and on behalf of Thrivent and our financial advisors, it's an honor to welcome you to this market and economic update. During our next hour together, we hope you'll gain a better understanding of what's happening in the economy and markets. We're gonna cover the current economy, including the financial health of the consumer, inflation, the geopolitical environment, and a topic that's especially relevant around the holidays given the role of retail and technology, large public companies. We'll talk about some specific companies as examples, but please note that anything we discuss today isn't intended to be a specific investment or product recommendation. We suggest connecting with your financial advisor about your personal financial strategy. We've incorporated your pre-submitted questions into our content, and we'll also get into those during our live Q&A later in the session. If you have a question at any time, you can type it into the Q&A box at the bottom of the Zoom screen. We're also going to try something a little more interactive this time with a few poll questions. Uh, you'll see a screen pop up through Zoom, and then you can select an answer from multiple choice options. If it doesn't work for you, don't worry. I'll share the results as we go. All right, it is time to hear from our panel. I am joined by Chief Financial and Investment Officer David Royal, Steve Lowe, Chief Investment Strategist, and our special guest, Lori Brunner, a Senior Portfolio Manager of Thrivent's Large Cap Growth Fund. Thank you all for being here. Good to be uh, here. My pleasure. Good David, morning. do you want to uh, introduce Lori and Steve? I'd love to. Uh, we'll start with Steve, who's familiar to our longtime viewers, uh, chief investment strategist. Uh, Steve actually started his career on the equity side, so picking stocks. And uh, before that, he was our head of fixed income. So Steve's, uh, Steve's done it all. And we're super thrilled to have our special guest here today, Lori. Lori runs our large cap growth fund, which is our largest single stock portfolio. But Lori's got such a fun background, uh, really focused around the intersection of the consumer and technology technology, started your career as a retail analyst, we'll talk a lot about that, and now covers a lot of the big name technology stacks. So thanks for being here, Lori. Thanks. A lot of shopping in stores. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Well, and David, it's always great to have Thank you here. You. And, and here, what insights you're seeing uh, from your kind of high level as Chief Financial and Investment Officer. So let us start right in. We're going to uh, talk about some macroeconomic trends. And David, my first question is for you. You've held a viewpoint for the last several months that rather than kind of being on a, a soft landing, we might actually be uh, on a soft takeoff or a, a slow takeoff. I'd love to hear why you hold this view. Sure. We talked about this a little bit at our, at our last market economic update, but we've only had four recessions in the last 40 years. And, you know, three, month, or three years into an economic recovery, it would be unusual to have another recession. And I think the economy's probably got a fair amount of momentum and, and maybe more than is, is commonly appreciated. We see this in our uh, private equity portfolio mm -hmm. across the insurance company. We'll maybe talk about that a little bit more later. Uh, but there's no question that stimulative, stimulative monetary and fiscal policy uh, pulled forward some demand during the pandemic. It loosened credit conditions. Um, and what that resulted in was a uh, need for some higher short-term interest rates uh, to soak up some of this extra liquidity we saw. And what we've seen in the industry is because of those short-term rates, we've seen money market fund assets in the industry roughly double from about $3 trillion before the pandemic to about $6 trillion now. And even at Thrivent, our money market fund we have about a billion dollars in extra assets in our money market fund above and beyond what uh, we would normally have. And that's money that it's slowed the economy by sitting on the sidelines, but will potentially strengthen the economy as, as it gets put to work. Um, and so the economy has slowed with uh, higher uh, short-term rates, but that's the whole point of the Fed <laughs> raising short-term rates. So I think there's a good chance that uh, instead of just avoiding a near-term recession, we can actually have this slow takeoff into a prolonged and sustainable economic recovery. Yeah, I, I like the analogy, which is a flying term. It's called touch and go, and it's what you do when you're learning to fly. You come in, and you land, you touch, and, and then you accelerate, and you take off again, and you go. So I think it's a good analogy for how we view the economy right now. You know, it'll slow down a little bit, but then it'll take off again. Mm -hmm. And third quarter GDP, the economy was very strong very in the third strong. quarter. So we are almost at the end of 2023, and despite a lot of different factors that you know often discussed, recession did not materialize. I'd like to hear from all three of you. Maybe I'll start with sure. you, David. Um, how you'd categorize 2023 from a macroeconomic perspective? You know, the economic data in 2023 has been better than pretty much anyone expected. Inflation moderated in a very orderly way. Uh, the labor market is still strong, but it's loosened somewhat. It's come down from about two job openings for every unemployed person to about 1.5. And actually, we 
just before we came on live here, we got the most recent data and showed a little further loosening of the job market, but still a healthy market overall. So again, you know, three years into an economic recovery, I think you'd have to have a really good reason to make a 2024 recession your base case, and I just don't see that in the economic data. Steve, what do you think? I would sum it up as resilient. Mm -hmm. I mean, because normally when the Fed raises rates, particularly aggressively like they have, a recession follows. You know, and I think this time is, is different as we haven't really had a pandemic before. Um, and it altered kind of normal economic relationships. And we had trillions of dollars in stimulus um, go into the economy. We had worker shortages, which led to a strong jobs market. But it also boosted income for people because wages went up. And then just reordered priorities. And all these forces enable the economy to weather what is a pretty strong headwind. If you, you know, the Fed raised rates, as I mentioned, Treasury rates went up to the highest level in 15 years. You had two of the three largest bank failures, Silicon Valley, um, mm -hmm. this spring. Mortgage rates hit 8%, yeah. uh, the highest in 20 plus years. You had a war in Ukraine already, then now we have one in the Middle East. And the second and third largest economies have struggled, which are you know, China and, and Europe. And, but the economy powered through all this. It's pretty incredible. Lori, how about from your perspective, what are you seeing in the economy? Sure, coming back to the consumer in 2023 and the, and the macro, we like to think of things in two buckets. So there are a group of consumers, I'll call them the least price sensitive of the consumers. They are spending on services, booking travel, booking mm -hmm. flights. There's another bucket that's the most price sensitive consumers, they're still fighting with inflation. So 60% of what the most price sensitive consumers spend money on every day, week, month, annually is two things, groceries and housing. And those costs are still going up. So two different buckets, I'd say the consumer is mixed. Yeah, tail of two consumers there. I want to stay with you, Lori. You, you pay close attention to the consumer as part of your investment process. Um, what are your observations? Tell us a little bit more about how people are doing. Sure. Well, if we look at the, the latest big event we had, the kickoff of the Christmas shopping season, so that's Black Friday through Cyber Monday, the early read on spend and traffic was pretty good. Mm -hmm. So what we don't want to see is the consumer be hesitant or pull back. I, didn't think we, I don't think we saw that. I think the consumer is okay just on the latest event within retail. If I go back to those buckets again, the least price sensitive consumer, last year she was spending five figures on kitchen remodels. This year it's a four figure vacation. Mm -hmm. We're not hearing about staycations yet. So that's the that's least good. price sensitive yeah. bucks, bucket. And for the most price sensitive bucket, Actually, Walmart, Target, and Amazon, three of the largest retailers on the planet, they all recently in the last few weeks reported their first quarter. They all said the same thing for the first time ever, which is the consumer is more price sensitive. Hmm. So what does that mean when you say price, price sensitive? Sure. So what they would see is if you were buying a six-pack of paper towels, you might buy a three-pack. Hmm. So what happens when the consumer is more price sensitive, she actually shops more frequently but less dollars with each trip. Okay. That's kind of the bottom line on that. Well, and I know from conversations with you, you focus on, on mom. You really talk about mom. Tell me why mom is so important. The data says that mom is the chief decision maker in the households for the spending. What comes into the household, furniture, groceries, all those things, mom is driving those purchases um, at home. Great. All right. Well, we're going to talk about inflation next, which has been a theme, I think, for a market and economics update all, all year. Um, all signs, Steve, are, seem to indicate that inflation is slowing down. What's the current thinking here? Yeah, inflation is slowing down, and it's slowing down pretty rapidly recently. It's down by about two-thirds, mm -hmm. and that's the consumer price index, which is the most commonly known index. So it fell from 9% to about 3%. And all the key drivers that drove it up are easing now. So that's goods inflation. Um, goods prices got very high in the pandemic. And the inflation rate is now about zero, and it's tipping over into deflation. Um, service inflation is also falling. Um, and the largest single component of that is about 30% of the whole inflation index is what they call shelter. Hmm. So that's rent of an apartment, rent of your home, and kind of the estimated cost of what it would cost you to rent your own home um, is high, but it's falling. And especially if you look at alternative measures like apartment lists mm -hmm. that track it, rents are, are decelerating pretty quickly right now. And, and then you have snarled supply chains. Mm -hmm. um, and they're starting to normalize. Um, and there's one index that the Fed started up recently that shows the pressure is the lowest in 25 mm -hmm. years now. Uh -huh. And then wage growth was a key issue too, and that's starting to slow. It's been a 
big concern for the Federal Reserve. Um, shortages of easing as more people are coming back into the workforce. There are fewer job openings, which we saw today in the data. And productivity is up. But there's still mm -hmm. sticky elements. And inflation is above the Fed's 2% target. But the trend is really encouraging. And think about lower inflation is that enables the Fed to pause and to eventually cut. Um, and, and we expect the trend of lower inflation to continue into um, next year. It's not a straight line, but steadily. Well, we're going to talk about inflation a little bit more, but first I want to ask our audience one of those poll questions. So um, the question is, did you postpone a major purchase? We'll let you define that. Um, in 2023, based on inflation and or higher interest rates, you've got three options. Yes, no, or C, maybe you didn't have any major purchases planned. And while you're plugging those in, let's talk again to Steve. Um, you know, this inflation story, as you alluded to, it, it's kind of a two-pronged, two right? There's one, bringing down inflation, uh, which the Fed has been focused on at a policy level, but it builds over time. And so um, while it's slowing down, those prices still feel pretty high. When might people actually start to feel some price relief? I think we're starting to see price relief, and I think more will come. So persistently high prices are a key issue. They, they pressure budgets, and you can see that in consumer confidence mm -hmm. surveys. Um, but remember, inflation is a rate of change. So say bread doubled one year, and the next year it stayed even. Then the inflation rate that year is zero, but it still costs twice as much as it did two years ago, which is the issue. So we'll leave will take time. Um, the first step is slower inflation, which we just talked about, and that's coming down now. And we expect that trend to continue into 2024. We're also starting to see pockets of deflation, um, especially in goods, and particularly in what are durable goods. So that's electronics, cars, appliances, that all shot up during the pandemic. But they're um, experiencing deflation now. Hmm. And a, another important area of relief will come from higher real wages. And by real, we mean inflation-adjusted wages after the impact of inflation. And that's enabled by improving productivity and also by lower inflation. You know, we've talked about productivity several times in the past, and that was one of my bigger concerns. The recent productivity data has been has been stronger. Uh, and Steve also mentioned real wages, another topic we've chatted about. Uh, those turned positive last summer on a year-over-year -year basis, so that'll provide some help for the consumer, too. Mm -hmm. Well, if we look at, at the... the um Responses to the poll, it looks like, let me do some quick math here, maybe around 45% of people said they did not change their plans, uh, major purchases. Um, maybe around 30% did, and another 30%, uh, my math is not quite right, uh, we'll say 25% said uh, they did not have any major purchases planned. So thank you, that's really insightful for us. Um, David and Steve, let's talk about the Fed. Uh, the last time they raised interest rates was at the end of July. Since then, the Fed has paused, and they've signaled that they're going to watch really closely what happens to make sure that inflation continues to move in the right direction before they would think about starting to cut rates. Um, assuming inflation does go where the, the direction the Fed hopes, um, what are the markets pricing in for cutting rates? What, and maybe what would this mean for clients? Certainly. Uh, the markets expect the Fed to start cutting rates next year. So the Federal Reserve controls what's called the federal funds rate, and that's a key short-term rate that influences all other interest rates in the economy, so that's why it's important. Um, and since March 2022, when they raised rates, they've gone from zero to five and a quarter and five and a half, and that's a pretty rapid and large jump. Um, the last raise, as you mentioned, in, in July, but they've been on hold since then. And recent speeches by some key Fed members indicate that the Fed will remain on hold, hmm. but also that they want to keep rates high for a long time, in, well into next year. Uh, the media calls that higher for longer, just to make sure that inflation doesn't come back again. Um, the market uh, has a different view. They expect, as of this morning, five cuts wow. um, next year. And the reasons are is they expect inflation to slow, which is happening, but also that they expect economic growth to slow somewhat uh, next year. You know, our own view is that they cut around mid-2024 next year. Um, so how does it impact clients? Um, through lower rates. And you've already seen that. Mortgage rates um, spike. They're off the peak right now. Um, you see auto loan um, lending rates come down. And then credit card rates, um, hopefully, they, they went uh, up to around 22% after the Fed raised rates. Um, they'll probably come down a little less slowly. They tend to be really sticky <laughs> on the way down. So, David, what do you think from a Sure. You know, I think it's important to keep in mind that the Fed can be cutting rates for negative reasons, and that would be a slowing economy or an impending recession. But in 2024, I think we, they could be lowering rates 
because of the decline in, you know, of inflation. And that has the effect of lowering the, uh, or raising the real interest rate as inflation comes down. And they have to cut short-term rates uh, to keep uh, real rates at a certain level and not over-tighten uh, financial conditions. So what does that mean for uh, consumers? Um, I mentioned last uh, market economic update the uh, the concept of reinvestment risk. Yeah. I, earlier, I mentioned all the money market fund assets that are kind of sitting on the sidelines, parked in money market funds, close to three trillion across the economy. It's important to keep in mind that when the Fed cuts short-term rates, that money market yield goes down immediately mm -hmm. with Fed rate cuts. Bank deposit rates are going to go down. CD rates will quickly adjust. And there's only one way to make money in a money market fund, and that's your yield. Whereas longer maturity bonds, you not only lock in a potentially attractive yield, but you also have the opportunity for price appreciation. So you have you have two ways to make money, uh, and not one. You know, another way to lock in yield is with fixed rate annuities. For example, a multi-year guaranteed annuity uh, lets your money grow at a fixed interest rate for a predetermined number mm -hmm. of years. So uh, this time, you, we, we, we've talked in the past about the, the interest rate volatility over the last couple quarters. Actually that uh, interest rates were maybe even more volatile in the third quarter. So I think this is a really good time to talk to a financial advisor about that fixed income mm -hmm. portfolio in this environment. Yeah, those our financial advisors are so helpful at thinking through those individual cases. Um, OK, so let's talk about the geopolitical environment. Um, you know, I, I would say, David, I'm going to come to you with this first question. The, the it's been consistently volatile, and and I before I ask the question, I do want to just note, you know, our hearts continue to go out to the lives that are impacted in both the, the Ukraine Russia war and also Israel and Hamas. Um, but we are dealing with new conflicts, and I'd love to know um, about the economic implications of the conflict in the Middle East. Yeah, thank you. And you know, it, it, this is absolutely not meant to diminish the human tragedies of, of these events, but the role of markets is to assess the economic impact. And historically, geopolitical events cause volatility, but the potential impacts are pretty quickly priced in. And it, it's the broader economy and, and corporate earnings growth uh, that really drive markets over the long term. And so far, uh, with respect to both conflicts, the market seems to have priced in uh, a relatively contained impact. Uh, I recall our first market and economic mm -hmm. update uh, going on to almost two years ago. Uh, it was shortly after the uh, invasion of Ukraine. Uh, Steve and I shared uh, examples of the last 100 years of major geopolitical conflicts. And what you found is uh, most often uh, the markets were only moderately affected and, and recovered quickly in mm -hmm. most of these cases. The main exception was the uh, Arab-Israeli war and the oil embargo from the 1970s. But it's important to realize uh, the US is in a very different position than the 1970s. Uh, we're now the largest oil producer in the world by, by a pretty large margin and a net exporter of petroleum. Mm -hmm. And so we're, again, we're in a very different position, particularly with respect to energy security. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the key risk in this conflict is that it goes wider and, and starts impacting oil supplies from the Mideas. But um, I don't think that'll happen because the key players appear not to have a want a broader war. Mm -hmm. And oil prices have come down significantly since October. Well, and, and my next question is actually one we saw in the pre-submitted questions uh, repeated. Um, here in the U.S., we are entering an election year. Would love to know, David, how much of a factor this will be for markets and the economy in 2024. Sure, it's a great question. Uh, and you know, elections rightfully get a lot of attention, but their effect on markets tends to be a little bit more muted maybe than, than most would think. Uh, we've had 20, uh, 24 presidential elections since 1928. Uh, in 20 of those 24 years, uh, the market's been up. But overall, the average isn't that different uh, than, than other years in the market. The third and fourth year of an administration tend to be a little better, and the first year of a new administration a little weaker. But if I was going to call out an impact for 2024, I would say that it might, at the margin, provide a small measure of downside protection uh, for, the, for the stock market. The current administration isn't likely to do anything that would actively slow the economy in an election year. Uh, and they, they, they've taken steps that, that have provided you know, potential short-term pro-consumer relief, uh, such as uh, relief, releasing oil from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve when oil prices were higher, uh, and proposing expanded student loan mm -hmm. relief. So I, I don't think you're going to get headwinds from the administration in the fourth year of, of of the term. And markets often like divided government. Yep. And the reason is you don't get you know large changes in, in policies because markets really like certainty. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, another, another theme that came through from the pre-submitted questions uh, was around national debt. It's been on the minds of our clients for quite some time, though the markets have seemed to not pay too much attention to it, even with really the debt ceiling conversations back in May and June. But now it seems like the markets have started to pay attention to it, too. Um, what are you seeing here? You know, the national debt is a major long-term issue. Uh, annual expense on the national debt uh, is now approaching a trillion dollars a year. Uh, just for comparison, in 2023, uh, we'll be spending about $817 billion on national defense. Mm -hmm. The total national debt is over 120% of gross domestic product, which is you know, the size of the overall economy. That's now higher than it was even uh, right after World War II. So you know, we're on an unsustainable fiscal path. I think pretty much everyone agrees on that on both sides of the aisle, even if they can't agree on what we might do about it or whether we should do anything uh, about it. But from the market's perspective, I think it's important to keep in mind that this isn't new news. We've known we have a deficit and debt problem for many years. And also, it's not an immediate problem, which is uh, probably why there isn't an urgent incentive for politicians to address this. And, and why do I say it's not an immediate problem? The dollar is still the world's reserve currency. Uh, we can issue debt uh, that is attractive in the markets, and there really isn't a realistic challenger globally to the dollar as the world's reserve currency. So. Long-term problem, but I wouldn't overestimate its impact on the markets for 2024. But still, the bond market this year has shown a few signs of stress that might be, might be related to the deficit and debt. Yeah, you want to talk about that, Steve? Sure. Uh, mm. Growing deficits are becoming a larger issue for the markets. And to fund deficit spending, you know, the Treasury has to issue more debt. And that comes in the form of Treasury bonds, which mm -hmm. are long-term instruments, and, and bills, which are short-term. And what you've seen is investors have, in turn, required higher payment to take on this kind of deluge of supply. And it's simply a matter of supply and demand. And the higher compensation comes in the form of higher interest rates, which increases the cost mm -hmm. of the debt. Um, we saw rates jump in October, in particular, um, due to concerns over U.S. debt levels and kind of a flood of Treasury issuance at that time. You know, and this comes at a time when key foreign buyers, um, China and Japan, have cut back on purchases and reduced their overall holdings of treasuries. And, and David made reference to this, but I think it's really important to understand that U.S. Treasury debt is still the global safety asset, and investors seek that in times of volatility. So, you know, you touched on the markets a little bit in those answers. I'd like to dive into our market insights. Um, Lori, coming to you, actually. Markets have had a, a very good year, and tech has been a big driver of that. In August, at our last market and economic update, we talked about the Magnificent Seven. So, Meta, Apple, Amazon, Alphabet or Google, Microsoft, NVIDIA, and Tesla. Would love to know, and these are names you're very familiar with. Uh, <laughs> would love to know if market growth is still being led by this kind of narrow group of just mega companies. Year to date, yes, that is the case. They are still leading the market. If you just back up the last couple of months, say August, no, September, or, um, September no, October, no. November, yes, that happened again in November. Uh, they were leading the market. But we have seen some broadening out in some other sectors. So software companies that aren't Microsoft, some of those stocks did really well just recently in November, so smaller in revenues than Microsoft, some financials, some real estate names. Uh, the energy sector's been left behind mm. uh, more recently in this year. And then if you think about the magnificent seven companies, uh, what we focus on is primarily revenue growth. So revenue growth rates, estimates, and actuals, what these companies have delivered, those numbers have moved up all year long. That's what has fueled the stocks this year. So if we think about the MAG-7, collectively, this group of seven companies, they will grow revenues about 10% this year. 2023 is almost over, so we can confidently say that. Next year, revenues are expected to accelerate. They're going to grow 12%. So we've seen acceleration coming. And just to give you a sense for how large these companies are, the base of revenues for these seven companies will be a trillion seven this year. Mm -hmm. That's up 10% from last year, and then growing 12% next year. So we think the, the outlook is really good for the MAG-7 going forward. Well, and if I remember correctly, it was kind of mid-year when NVIDIA reported that, that the stocks really took off. That's right. They led it. Yeah. Um, so outside of the Magnificent Seven, what are you seeing, Lori? Let's start with you in the large cap space. Sure. I can 
talk about or think about what comes to the forefront are two of the sectors, two large sectors within um, in large cap and what we track. The first uh, technology, the story there has been initially on hardware and then semiconductors and then NVIDIA primarily. So they are an early beneficiary of the generative AI, artificial intelligence movement or landscape. What we're seeing, they se NVIDIA sells the chips that hmm. compute answers and content that are coming out of this generative AI movement. So that's what's uh, been the story so far. We, what we think the next story will be within technology is the software companies. So that's the work we're doing now. Which of the large or smaller software companies will be the first and benefit the most from generative AI? A number of people have talked about when is the killer app coming, the killer <laughs> application that either consumers will use or businesses will use from generative AI, we're certainly looking for that. The other story or theme would be healthcare, which is a large segment for us that we cover. cover. And some of the largest pharmaceutical companies have been great stocks this year because they've been beneficiaries of the Ozempic movement. Mm. So in general, the story there is that diabetes drugs are being used to tackle obesity. And some of the signs are it's gonna be very effective. That's mm. the early read. But the potential is that if you take, if you beat obesity, you can take a bite out of long-term health care costs. So on conditions that ride along with people that have obesity, the promise is significant because it's believed that about 100 million people in the U.S. are wow. obese. So there's a long runway there potentially. So those are the two stories within large cap. Yeah. Outside of large cap, Steve, what are you seeing? Yeah, so outside of the mega caps, uh, performance has been a lot more muted. Mm -hmm. So the S&P um, on price returned about 18% through November. 14 percentage points of that come from the beginning of the seven, and just four from the other 493 stocks in the S&P 500. Wow. So uh, looking at large caps more broadly, growth stocks have all performed. So this includes the magnificent seven, but more broadly, uh, it's stocks that are growing quickly or have growth attributes. Um, technology companies, pharmaceuticals, and they have outperformed, largely as investors have sought safety with mm -hmm. expectations that growth will slow. Um, quality also has outperformed, that's very related to growth. It's companies with uh, strong earnings, strong financial um, situations and balance sheets. You know, on the flip side, what we call value has underperformed. And these are companies with lower valuation multiples, um, industrials, financials, and, and value stocks tend to be more cyclical. Um, and are more challenged in a slowing growth environment. Uh, although they have um, picked up over the past week or so, but mm. you know it's only one week. So, um, <laughs> but we do expect value should fare better as you get into 2024, um, as a tailwind from the economy increases and eventually picks up. Right. David, what do you think? Yeah, I'll echo Steve's comments. You know, if, if, if we're right and the economy's in this slow takeoff, uh, with inflation and interest rates coming down and still some solid economic growth, uh, then I do think we'd see some um, some rotation away from the 2023 winners to uh, 2023's laggers. And, and the theme, as Steve said, is, is toward these more cyclical companies. I mean, the market flocks to big, growthy, stable companies uh, in times of uncertainty. And if we're getting a little more certainty, a little more on the economy uh, and have confidence in its trajectory, I think you could lean more cyclical. Steve mentioned uh, value companies like industrials and financials could outperform. Uh, uh, smaller companies also hmm. tend to be more cyclical and, and economically sensitive. Uh, you know, small caps are are quite uh, inexpensive historically compared to large caps, in significant part because of the big run-up in the Magnificent Seven. But these smaller companies tend to be more higher, highly leveraged, so they could benefit from uh, declining uh, interest rates since they're more re uh, reliant on borrowing. Um, and But with small caps, you do have to be willing to be a little bit early. Uh, these names, when these smaller companies, when they rally, they tend to rally really hard, uh, really quickly, and we saw that in the first part of 2021. So again, yeah, it might, have, might be a little early, but the fact couple of weeks, as Steve said, we've seen some strength and some broadening out of the market, including small caps. Mm -hmm. um, the housing market is also something I want to talk about. And we have a poll question for you, audience. Um, how has the current housing market altered your near-term home buying plans? Or uh, Sorry, not how, just has it. Um, a, yes, it has. B, no, it hasn't. Or C, you maybe don't have any plans to buy or sell a home in the near future. While you're answering that, I want David to talk a little bit about housing. It's been an often discussed topic over the last few years. Prices spiked during the pandemic. They haven't really come down. What are you seeing on the housing front? 
Sure. So home equity has increased dramatically in the past few years. You know, it's about 28.6 trillion now, uh, up from 18.6 trillion in early 2019. So that's 10 trillion dollars in additional home equity uh, just in the last four years. At the same time, home equity lines of credit, so people borrowing against that home equity, uh, is, is quite low historically at about 270 billion. Uh, for comparison, in 2009, right at coming out of the financial crisis, maybe in the middle of the financial crisis, uh, home equity lines were uh, more than double that at $674 billion. Wow. So this is a potential source of untapped funds uh, for consumers. Uh, Supply is down of existing homes. I think most have probably experienced that. If you have a 3% mortgage, you're probably not going to put your home on the market. And that has uh, inventory at 30-year lows, uh, which means also we have the oldest housing stock that we've had since the 1940s coming out of World War II. Wow. Well, Home Depot talks about that on every public conference yeah. call. <laughs> They've referenced the age of the housing wow. stock. So that's yep. right in line with what yeah. you're saying. Yeah. And so the converse of that is new construction now makes up the majority of home sales. Uh, whereas norm in a normal market, existing home sales would be 85 or 90 percent and you know, new construction would be 10 or 15, something like that. Um, and, and part of the reason for this shortage is that household formation, so just the need for housing based on growth in the population, uh, is outpaced construction. It's depending how you measure it, several million, certainly mm -hmm. millions uh, of housing units undersupplied. Uh, a challenge for consumers is that the percentage of disposable income required to buy a home, think affordability, uh, because of the increase in home prices, because of the scarcity and the increase in interest rates, is almost as high as it's ever been. So home affordability mm. is makes, a real challenge. Yeah, it makes it tough for those first time home buyers. Yeah, uh, we don't think a full blown housing recession is likely for okay. all the reasons supply is down, demand is up. That's not when you, you have a housing recession. Uh, but there are winners and losers, and you mentioned you know, the challenge for, for new home buyers. Uh, the winners are likely home builders or, or companies that participate in, in home construction, like you know Home Depot, uh, and, and con those consumers with sub four percent mortgages uh, who don't have to move. All right. Well, let's get the answer to the poll. Um, so, twenty percent of you said that yes, the current housing market has altered your plans. Seven percent of you said no, it has not. And seventy-four percent of you didn't have plans to buy or sell in the first place. I think that sounds. And hopefully, they're about, sitting on some four percent. That's right. Mortgages. Exactly. <laughs> and, and lots of home equity. Um, okay, so let's talk about large company insights. Lori, this is where we get to go deep with you, which I'm really looking forward to. You specifically cover large growth companies. These are companies that are poised to grow faster than their competitors. And you are also one of the front runners to really see the potential for Amazon to become the behemoth that it is today. What did you see in Amazon? We purchased shares of Amazon at Thrivent in July of 2007. Not 2017, 2007, so we've been in there a long time. They did, the company did $14 billion of revenue that year. This year they're going to do 570. So the year's almost wrapped, wrapped up. Oh. That's 40 times more revenue. So it's been a really long runway for growth, great growth story. Early on I said this is not a bookseller, this is not a DVD seller. They're going after the general merchandise market in retail. And that market is a few trillion dollars of revenues every year. So I saw them going after a large large marketplace. That means a long runway for sales growth. We've seen that, we think that continues. We also recognize that there was a pivot by the company or a second act, and those are really valuable. For them, it's the cloud business. So what is, what is the cloud business? Essentially, it's renting hardware. So if David starts a software company and he says, I don't want to buy mainframes, I don't want to buy servers, he can rent those, that hardware, for Amazon because he's only using it part of the time to compute a software company. You can rent that from Amazon. That's the cloud business. For them, that'll be $90 billion in revenues this year. Also very large market globally. Global enterprise IT spending will be about $2 trillion this year. So Amazon saw another large market, went after it. They have a very large and growing business there. So those two things were important. Circling back to the core business um, of retail, what they are trying to do overall, the long game that they're playing is reduce friction, mm. right? Take the chore out of shopping. So initially it was just deliver the prime box in two days. That was the promise. What they've been trying to do for years is compress that time from two days down to now the goal is sub two hours. So that's what they've been working on. That's the path they're on. That's been the long-term goal for them. Hmm. So, you know, thinking about that, that process by which you kind of looked at Amazon, how does that relate to your kind of broader view? Right. We, our team, we 
try to spend a lot of time sizing markets. How big are these markets? How big is the sandbox that a company plays in? Who are their competitors? How are they participating? What are their initiatives? How are they going to drive growth? All of this we're trying to do, we're trying to find another Amazon. Hmm. So how about um, some of the primary factors influencing growth at large public companies? I'm going to put it in two buckets again. Uh, my boss likes these buckets. It's wants <laughs> and needs. Um, so the needs for these large public companies, they need to drive organic revenue growth. They need to contain costs. Uh, Steve used this word snarl. A lot of large co companies are still trying to unsnarl mm -hmm. some of these supply chain events over the last couple years. Some of them are going one way, some are the other. It's very complicated. But company initiatives and then how well managements execute will determine if they're driving revenues, containing costs. So that's on the, that's on the, the need side. On the want side, a lot of it is, is tied to generative AI. So I would say all large cap companies are considering the opportunity of generative AI. They're, they're uh, considering can it drive productivity improvement at our company? Can we use technology to give me a personalized offer or coupon that would make me, when I'm browsing on Amazon, buy even faster? But think about that for small or large businesses. If you can use technology to speed up the time to purchase, that's part of the promise for generative AI. AI. So that's the wants piece. And the largest public companies have some of the biggest advantages in that area, and they have some good head starts um, in the wants. And a lot of it is centered around generative art artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. So uh, you just talking about Amazon makes me think about shopping, right? And I want to ask our audience a poll. Um, we'd love to know if you plan to do your Christmas shopping primarily online or primarily in stores. A, in stores, B, primarily in line, or we'll give you a, an option of C, an even split of both. And while you answer, Lori, um, you do invest in some of those biggest names in retail. The pandemic pushed a lot of us further on our digital shopping journeys, um, but I'd love to know if you see that trend continuing. And then I'd also like to know, you know, if things like inflation are influencing shopping trends for large retail companies. There was a jump up in, um, in e-commerce spending due to the pandemic, for sure. But if we look at 2023, not a large change, I'll say 80% of sales for the holiday are going to be done in stores, 20% oh. online. So maybe last year it was 19, this year it'll be 20. So moving up, mm -hmm. but not dramatically. The big jump, like I said, was during the pandemic. One of the things that I, I, I like that I'm seeing that's getting more traction, I saw it before uh, COVID, but now it's ramped up and I've been seeing it in stores now. It's called BOPUS, buy online, pick up in stores. So that's all Bopus, those people okay. with the carts <laughs> that you see in the yeah. stores. They're filling up your online order and then David's driving up into the drive through lane to pick up his <laughs> order. So BOPUS is, I call, the third leg of the shopping stool. And so that, again, was there before the pandemic, took off, and it's a great option. Consumers love it. Every, every retailer, large retailer, is talking about BOPUS, buy online, pick up in store. So if you dial back to the current shopping season, uh, we haven't heard that consumer electronics are at the forefront. Those are typically large ticket items under the tree. Maybe consumers are waiting for prices to go down a little more. So I think what's gotten traction to date with the holiday season, apparel items, beauty items, uh, Barbie Malibu Dream House uh, has <laughs> been uh, popular. Yeah, yeah, it's been popular. So um, that's what's been popular overall. But for the season, I don't think that inflation will cause consumers to, to hesitate for the season, so that's good news. Mm -hmm. Mom wants to deliver a good Christmas. Yes, she does. <laughs> okay, so we have results on the poll. It, it actually, our audience varies a little bit. 17% um, of them said that they would primarily do their shopping in stores. 45% are going to primarily shop online. And uh, about 39% have that uh, even split of both. So um, that's just, really great insight. Is, They're it? leading. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you guys are leading. I yeah, like exactly. It. Okay, so let's take a couple minutes and talk about asset classes. Um, Steve, I'll let you start. Certainly. Um, you've heard us talk, we're relatively optimistic, so we're moderately overweight equities right now, and we're overweight domestic equities, U.S. equities. Um, so that includes large caps and mid caps, and we're about neutral right now in small caps. So that means that we're underweight international equities, including developed and also emerging markets. 
um, you know, expect to, the Fed to pause and, and to cut rates into 2024 eventually. Um, we think they're done hiking. And then Treasury rates also will follow Fed funds lower, mm. and they've already started declining. Um, and we think yields and fixed income look really attractive. David, what about on the private equity side? Yeah, you know, I mentioned this earlier. Uh, you know, I, private we have private investments in, in hundreds of companies across different industries across the entire United States, and you know what we're seeing is is solid growth in earnings in these private companies, which I think gives us a little bit of an insight into the public markets as well. You know, sn supply chain issues have abated, or they've become a little less snarled. Uh, <laughs> we've seen, uh, but you know, overall the labor challenges have have, have also uh, moderated. Uh, you know, wage growth is come down a little bit, uh, and, and turnover has come down. Mm. I think I've, we've talked in the past that just even if you can find new employees, the turnover can be dis especially disruptive at smaller companies, and we've seen that uh, abating. All right, I'm really excited for this next question. We, ha we have props in front of us here. Um, I want to know each of your kind of 2024 outlook, but you've brought in a Christmas ornament that you're going to relate to your outlook. So David, let's start with you. Tell us what you're thinking for 2024 and why you chose the ornament you did. Sure. So this ornament, I actually just plucked off the royal family Christmas tree. I did not buy this for this event. I don't even know when we when we got it. Uh, but you know, I think uh, everyone's aware. I'm, I'm optimistic for 2024. I think the economy will continue in its slow takeoff. Uh, but anyone who's ridden on a small propeller plane knows, you know, there's a lot of it can be bumpy. Yeah. There's a few ups and downs as you take off. So I'm sure there'll be some volatility and some ups and downs in 2024. But uh, I'm, I'm optimistic for the year. Great. Steve, what are you thinking with your ornament here? Well, this is a dove. Mm -hmm. um, if it's Christmas, it's a symbol of, of hope and peace. Um, but it's also uh, emblematic of our outlook, which is that the Fed is going to turn more dovish. Ah. So you hear people talk about a hawkish and a dovish Fed. A dovish means they're likely to lower rates and ease monetary policy, and that's good. That's a key catalyst for having a soft landing. Um, so it makes us more optimistic into next year. All right, Lori, I'm very certain I see some prime boxes here in your ornament. What are you, what are you thinking? Well, Callie, when you called me and said, what do you think about ornaments? And I, I, I said, this is great. I haven't been shopping on Amazon for about 12 hours, so I need to go back. <laughs> <laughs> and this is an ornament about Amazon from Amazon. There are prime envelopes in here. There are prime boxes, and there's a stack of them. So if I think about large public companies or the Mag 7, some, it'll probably be called something else next year. Amazon's an everyday event in your house. Yes. Right? yes. I was going to say, is that an average <laughs> stack that's at your door when you get home? <laughs> Pretty close. But my expectation is that we'll have the boxes signify revenue growth for 24 and a good outlook. I love it. All right. Well, I brought in also from, from my tree, I think this is from maybe 1987, Edna Schaefer, um, but it's a mailbox. And regardless of what is happening in the uh, markets of the economy, I know that um, Thrivent, we will be here for our clients to uh, give you the guidance and advice that you need. So with that, we're going to go to live Q&A. This is your opportunity to ask questions to David, Steve, and Lori. Remember, you can answer them into the uh, box on the Zoom. And we have um, our first question. David, I'm going to come to you. With the high rate of commercial property bank vacancy, how do you see commercial property costs heading um, since work from since the work from home economy yeah, no, I mean, there definitely are challenges in commercial real estate, particularly in the office space. And, you know, we're probably going to have to, uh, you know, resize, uh, you know, our expectations. And, and, you know, it's harder to convert office space to residential than a lot of people think in terms of zoning and codes and you need windows and, and, and things like that. Uh, but what I am happy to share is uh, Thrivent, Thrivent, the insurance company, has a large commercial real estate portfolio. It's almost $10 billion. Uh, we have very little office exposure, particularly very little office exposure in major urban areas. When we do have office exposure, it's more, think, suburban medical and that sort of thing. We would be more, other, other types of commercial real estate would be things like Amazon warehouses. We have, you know, far more in that area and multifamily housing for all the reasons I mentioned yeah. earlier. There's a shortage of housing. So uh, Thriving overall has very little exposure to uh, office real estate. Yeah, and it's interesting, you're starting to see some large investors um, invest in commercial real estate, yeah. particularly office buildings now yeah. on a bet on the future and that um, that'll come back. Mm -hmm. 
Um, here's a question that's come in uh, about our outlook for oil prices. Um, well, we're, we're in a bear market. Um, oil is down pretty sharply despite the war in the East. Um, so OPEC Plus is kind of the broader OPEC um, organization that tries to control supply and they've been cutting supply. They just had a meeting recently where they agreed to cut supply further. But what you're seeing is the demand part of that equation is really driving um, oil prices. The global economy is slowing and in particular China has slowed significantly and that's a key driver. So, um, you know, I, I think that will have larger sway in, mm. into next year. Mm -hmm. um, Lori. A question for you. Um, you obviously managed, you know, some big names during the pandemic. How uh, how did you navigate that and kind of find equilibrium in the midst of so much kind of disruption and turmoil? Thinking back to that time, I, I guess I'll put things into two buckets again. So first, Amazon, which we've owned for many years. So the pandemic hit. It was it. Uh, we could tell right away this one was going to be a, a winner, the stock, and a big winner, right? Because people are at home, they're ordering everything th from their house, and a lot of it's coming from Amazon. So we had a big uplift there in their business, in the stock. So that was one bucket of how we were managing. So luckily we could see that going on, and we were, we were shareholders. The other opportunity was the businesses where the stocks were getting slammed because nobody was coming in the door. And so what we did, we took that opportunity, so two things going on, the Amazon piece. And then the other side of that is what I've often talked about is my UCLA acronym, <laughs> which was stocks that were getting slammed. We bought Uber. We bought Live Nation. We bought Chipotle. We bought American Express. If you think about all those businesses impacted by COVID initially, rebounded later. So we had those two different dynamics going on, um, luckily, but we did have a big winner. Kind of taking advantage of the buy low. Yes. yes. There. Yeah. Um, David, we, we have uh, this question was a, a theme submitted uh, from, from the pre submitted questions, and it's around um, a central bank digital currency. Would love to hear, you know, kind of your thoughts on the development of that. Sure, there's a, there's a lot of discussion about central bank digital currency, which is a, a digital currency that's sponsored and, and backed by uh, a central bank. Uh, and with the growth in cryptocurrency and stable coins, there's been a lot of discussion, not just in the US, but in central mm -hmm. banks across the globe, about potentially sponsoring uh, a new digital currency. I think it's something, like a, like a lot of things we've talked about today, I think this is a very important long-term trend, and it's something we keep a close eye on. We do have people on our staff who, who are much more conversant in this than I am. Uh, but I don't think it's uh, going to have an immediate impact on you know, the stock bond markets or the dollar in 2024, but we're definitely keeping an eye on it as a longer term trend. Mm -hmm. um, how about, uh, we have a question here, where do bonds fit into a diversified portfolio? Or uh, even, you know, maybe the question is, do they fit? Steve, I'm sure you have a perspective on that. They fit now. <laughs> <laughs> Um, not so well a couple of years ago, in 2022 in particular. Um, you had kind of a historically poor performance, what's commonly called like a 60-40 portfolio, 60% uh, stocks, 40% fixed income, because um, they weren't diversifying that. But now that uh, the Fed is expected to ease into next year, you're seeing treasury rates come down, and they are diversifying again and, and do belong within a, a mixed asset portfolio. Mm -hmm. Um, another person writes, uh, although I have a few individual stocks, the majority of my, of my investments are with the S&P 500. Do you feel this is a good approach? David, I would love your thoughts. You know, there's nothing wrong with buying a broad index. Uh, you know, in the S&P 500, of course, it's the large cap index. It's dominated by the Magnificent Seven. <laughs> uh, and Steve talked about the return of the S&P 500, how it was really driven by the Magnificent Seven and not the other 493 stocks this year. Uh, but I would think about diversifying beyond that. Um, and, and, you know, we're, we're strong believers in, in active management, so we think we have some great managers across you know, a variety of asset classes, but maybe diversifying a little bit into small caps, which have underperformed pretty meaningfully. Uh, you know, one area that we, we, we didn't talk about, Steve mentioned we're overweight, uh, mid-cap stocks. We really like mid-caps on just sort of a long-term basis. If all things being equal, we, we, we usually like mid-cap stocks because they have somewhat less risk than small-cap stocks, uh, but their next years or next decades large cap stocks mm -hmm. that eventually Lori has. So Lori mentioned NVIDIA, you know, for years we held that in our mid cap portfolio mm -hmm. before I graduated to Lori. <laughs> um, how about, uh, you know, similar theme looking at emerging markets? What are we seeing there? Yeah, well, we're underway, as we mentioned, emerging markets. And the largest component of that is China. 
mm. um, which is uh, struggling to get growth to what they normally expect. Mm. Um, and, and part of that is kind of global trade in general has slowed down. Um, and China is a key trading economy. Um, the property market there also is um, very challenged right now, and you're seeing prices fall. And it's a key part of their growth, and in particular, housing is a key part of wealth for hmm. individual um, Chinese people. And um, they also have a, a, a debt problem, hmm. too. Um, so we're underway with that. Um, the other large emerging markets, um, Korea and Taiwan, are going to be more tied to global trade. Um, and, and we expect that to tick up eventually. Um, but overall, we're um, underway at the emerging markets right now. So, Lori, we have, a, we have a question for you. I'm not surprised this one came in. You manage some companies with uh, CEOs or founders who have pretty big personas. Um, would love to know kind of how you manage um, with that. So I can talk about a couple of my favorite guys. <laughs> so first I'll start with Amazon again. I'll, I'll do two buckets. Amazon.com, founded by Jeff Bezos. Over the years that we've, we've owned the shares since 2007, he's been a behind the scenes executive. So he created it, he's running it all the time. He wasn't on the conference calls. In fact, we never wanted him to show up. We thought that would be bad news if he actually showed up on, on conference calls. So he had a low profile style while he was at the helm of that company. Now he's since turned that over to Andy Jassy. It's slightly different, um, but still relatively low profile. So that was my favorite uh, guy <laughs> managing a business. On the other uh, side of that, also a Magnificent Seven company run by Elon Musk. So he is a prolific tweeter mm. or Xer, if you want to call it that now. So and he runs several businesses, uh, had invested in other businesses previously. They're pulling him back in. So he's very high profile, does a lot of interviews, always in the news. So not my preferred style, but I think he's a fantastic uh, visionary and CEO. So we, we, we've experienced both. We've lived both, Kelly. Okay. Um, how about, you know, manufacturing? We have a question here. They're seeing more headlines about manufacturing kind of struggling. Would love to know, you know, Steve, what are you seeing maybe here and globally? Yeah, and met, we've talked a little bit about this. Manufacturing is a challenge right now. Um, there are surveys that show it's in contraction in the United States and has been, and also globally and in uh, Europe and uh, China too. Um, manufacturing tends to be mean reverting. There's a cycle to it, and it's pretty regular. Mm -hmm. So you're starting to see signs that it's ticking up a little bit, um, which is our expectation. Um, that it will. And if you look at the United States in particular, um, I think manufacturing is a really good long-term story. Because one thing that the pandemic did is snarl supply chains. And a lot of people wanted to uh, bring manufacturing back here, or at least have that for a little resiliency in supply chains. And, and you're seeing investment in kind of middle America um, with factories. You're seeing some chip manufacturing come back here. Um, there's economists that I follow who like to say middle America is the new emerging market. Hmm. I like that. Um, how about, I, I'll let you guys, you all pick who, who wants to respond, maybe a combination. What industry sectors do you anticipate be, to be strong in 2024? Uh, tech and, and what else? I have to say tech. We, it has to start in tech. We're at the advent, we're on the edge of something in tech called generative artificial intelligence. This is just software to the nth degree, right? It's the capabilities of software, what it can do, what it can compute, the algorithms, what they can create and generate. So I have to say that's what I'm optimistic about. No, we don't know if it's going to show up in the company's revenues in the first half or the second half, but there's a lot of work being done on is it coming? We believe it's coming. And again, we're the winners and, and uh, focus on the winners and avoid the losers. Anything else you I'm happy about? to go. Okay, great. Uh, you know, one sector I, have, I personally haven't talked about as much is healthcare. And mm -hmm. if we were going to pick two industries with very strong long-term tailwinds, it would be technology and healthcare. And healthcare, of course, driven by uh, demographics and an aging population. And a number of healthcare stocks, very you know, large companies, quality companies, uh, for reasons Lori mentioned, uh, have healthcare's underperformed this year, a, lot, a, a large portion of it. And so I think there could be some good long term opportunities in healthcare after a, a pretty weak year for, for the sector. We could and see some shifts. Yeah, I think right? we I mean, probably that's will. it. You know, that's what we're looking for is the 
uh, diabetes to obesity and the, the therapies that are being used along with that, is that real? When is yeah. it gonna, when are we gonna see an uptake? What's the traction? The promise is there, but we'll see. Yeah. But our, our focus is always gonna be on winners and losers. And, and technology really isn't just in the tech industry. I mean, like Amazon, you could argue, is a, you know, a tech company, they're consumer discretionary. So that, that's another thing to look for, is just how is technology changing other industries? Yeah. You know, they, I will say that they, I believe, I firmly believe Amazon sees themselves as a technology company first, logistics company hmm. second, and a retailer third. Yeah. Oh, interesting. All right, well, as we talk about, you know, moving into 2024, we're also thinking about closing out 2023. Um, we're gonna close down our live Q&A. Thank you for those great questions. And David, I wanna give you an opportunity to, uh, to tell us, you know, how Thrivent fared during this past year. Sure, uh, and you know, putting on my CFO hat for a second, uh, Thriven is, is, I think most of our clients know, very financially strong, stable, and well positioned to serve our clients in the future. Uh, happy to, to, to share, and some of our viewers may have seen the announcement that we recently announced $542 million in dividends and other policy enhancements for 2024. That's up 22% uh, from 2023, and I, I went back and looked, and that's up over 80% from 2021 and 2022. Uh, so good to give money back to our members, Absolutely. and it's really driven by financial stewardship and, and strong investment returns. And maybe to end on some other good yeah. news, and I'll highlight uh, something else that makes us unique and financial financial services, and that's our commitment to living generously at Thrivent. Uh, Giving Tuesday was a week ago today. Uh, it's very timely. Uh, and as usual, uh, our clients uh, and, and stepped up, and uh, we can, you can see the impact on your screen, over $1.4 million to 27 uh, not-for-profits driven by client engagement and Thrivent's match. So just a great story as we enter the, the holiday season. That's an amazing story. We have uh, pretty fantastic clients, the best, I would say. Well, we are at the end of our time. Thank you, David, Steve, and Lori for, for sharing your insights today. Um, a reminder as we sign off, schedule some time with your financial advisor so your financial strategy is up to date and your position to take advantage of potential opportunities, of course, based on your long-term goals and your risk tolerance. Thanks again for joining us for this market and economic update. It is our privilege to be part of your financial journey. And with that, we'll say goodbye. We wish you and your loved ones a Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays. Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas.